In this lesson, we will discuss different types of transformations that can occur to functions. We're going to be looking at some of these different parent functions that we discussed. We're actually going to approach these problems from a little different perspective than how these questions in the notes are written, but I think you're going to find uh, it will make them a little bit easier to work with. So instead of taking a lot of time to graph all of these as this is asking for instead, we will simply describe from looking at the equation what type of transformation has occurred. If you happen to have access to a graphing calculator, it's very helpful to look at the difference between the original parent function graph and the one that's transformed in the equation that's given. Um, if we had more time, I would demonstrate for you on the graph exactly how it changes. But since we're doing this as an online class and it would take too much time to add that visual element, I'm going to explain to you the parts that you would look for. If you pay attention on A and B on this classroom example one, what you notice is the parent is the quadratic function. We have the x squared that's in the equation, but the only thing that's different is we now have a coefficient other than one in front of the x squared. Now in the first one, example A, our coefficient is two. And what that's going to tell us is either this graph is stretched vertically or it will be shrunk vertically. If it's stretched vertically, that will make it appear narrower. If it is shrunk or compressed vertically, that will make it appear wider. So when we look at the value of that coefficient, that will be what tells us if it stretches or if it shrinks. So here is the basic rule we want to follow. If we have some value in front of our function, in this case in front of the x squared, then what will be true, we're not going to pay any attention to whether it's positive or negative. We're just going to look at the absolute value of that coefficient. If it's greater than one, then we have a vertical stretch. It is a vertical stretch. And that would mean that it appears narrower. Now, if the absolute value of A is something between 0 and 1, so if it's a fractional value between 0 and 1, then it is a vertical shrink, which means if I press it down vertically, that causes it to spread out wider. So that's all we have to do is pay attention to the value of the number that's in front of the function. And in A, since the value is 2 and 2 is greater than 1, that tells us that we have a vertical stretch of 2. And I will not ask you to graph it. I will only ask you to explain what the transformation is or possibly to look at some uh, different graphs and in a multiple choice format and choose the one that would match this description. Now if you move over to B, what you're going to see is that the uh, coefficient value is one half, which happens to be between zero and one. And since that's true, it tells me that this is a vertical shrink of one half. So that's what the value at the beginning of the function, if we have a coefficient in front of the entire function, that will be what it tells us. Now I want you to notice the example C is different because we don't have the one half 
just in front of the x squared. The 1 half is just in front of the x, and then the entire thing is being squared. When that happens, that is not a vertical transformation. That's actually one that would be a horizontal. And I will tell you, um, I'm not going to ask you to identify horizontal stretches and shrinks that um, we could do it, but we are not going to for this course. But that's going to be how we tell the difference between whether we have a vertical stretch or shrink or if it's horizontal. If the uh, coefficient is applied only to the x before anything else happens to the x in the function, then that means it's a horizontal transformation. Uh, let's go look at the next slide. And what we see is a summary statement about what we just explored. So if we have some function, and notice it has the a in front of it. So in other words, we get this coefficient times the original function. Then we would say as long as the a value is greater than 1, then we would say that that function is a vertical stretch of the original function. But if the a value is between 0 and 1, then it would be a vertical shrink. And you might want to make a note that a stretch, vertical stretch, would make it look more narrow. But a vertical shrink would make it look wider. And we will skip the part on the horizontal. And we're going to move on to the next part, reflections. Now, if we have a reflection across an axis, we only have two axes, an X and a Y. And again, we have to pay attention to where the sign would appear. We know that a negative sign in front of a function is telling us that there is a reflection. We discussed this briefly when we looked at quadratics before, that if it's a positive in front of the X squared, it means the parabola opens up. If it's a negative in front of the X squared, it means it opens down. That indicates that we've had some sort of reflection over the x-axis. And so that's what you check if the negative sign is in front of the entire function. Notice here, our parent function is the absolute value of x. That tells us that this would reflect over the x-axis. Now, if you happen to see that the negative is actually inside whatever the function is, that it's only being applied to the x, as in example b, then the absolute value of negative x tells us that it actually reflects over the y-axis. And depending on what our function is that we start with, it may or may not appear to be the same. For instance, if you were thinking about uh, this example on B, the absolute value function, the absolute value function actually uh, has symmetry about the y-axis already. So y equals the absolute value of x is that v-shape that looks like this, generally speaking. But you know what? Because there is symmetry about the y-axis, if I fold this on the y-axis and the sides switch over, it's going to look identical. Um, that will not always happen if you have the transformation that causes the function to reflect over the y-axis. But if you already had symmetry about the y-axis, then the function will look the same. So those are our tests to see if we have symmetry with respect to an axis. And let's move on to the next slide. So, when we reflect across an axis, if the negative sign is in front of the entire function, that would mean we're going to reflect across the x-axis. But, if uh, the negative sign is in front of only the x, that means we reflect across the y-axis. Now, from here, that tells us something about some points that we would have on the graph. Let's back up for a minute. If we have symmetry 
uh, with, well, not if we have symmetry, if we reflect across the x-axis, what that tells me is whatever point is on the original function, if I have the point x comma y, when it reflects over the x-axis, the sign of the y will change, and that will cause that this point to end up being graphed at x comma negative y. If I have symmetry across the y-axis, that same point, x, y, when it reflects over the y, causes the sign of the x to change. And that would mean that it becomes the point negative x, comma, y. So those are going to be helpful for us in just a moment when we start looking at tests for symmetry. Because since we know if it reflects over one of these axes what happens to the point that's involved, um, that's going to give us a test to see if we have symmetry. So, look at the next box. The graph of an equation is symmetric with respect to which axis if the replacement of x uh, with negative x would result in an equivalent equation. Well, when the sign of the x value changes, that tells me I had symmetry with respect to the y-axis. And that means that the point negative x comma y is on the graph whenever the point x y was on the graph. Now if I'm looking and I see that if I were to replace y with negative y and I get an equation that's equivalent, that tells me that I have to have symmetry with respect to the x-axis. And that would mean that the point x comma negative y is on the graph whenever I have the point x, y. So let's run through some quick tests for symmetry. If I want to see if any of these functions would be symmetric to the x-axis or the y-axis, here's the way that I would run the test. On the first one, x equals the absolute value of y. If I test for symmetry with respect to the x-axis, remember that means that the sign of the y would change. If I can change the sign of the y and I get an equivalent equation, I've got symmetry with respect to the x-axis. So for my test, I will turn y into negative y, and then I'll determine if that means the same thing, if it's equivalent to my original equation. And you know what? It doesn't matter if y is positive or negative. When I take the absolute value of it, I'm going to get the same x value. That means I do have symmetry with respect to the x-axis. Now to run the test for the y, I have to change the sign of the x value. So in this original equation, I would want to ask, is negative x equal to the absolute value of y equivalent or the same as x equals the absolute value of y? And hopefully when you look at that, you will see, first of all, if I take the absolute value of some number, I am not going to get a negative value back. Um, this is certainly not going to be equivalent to the original because the sign of the x has changed. So I, it doesn't pass the test for symmetry to the y-axis, but it is symmetric with respect to the x-axis. Okay, look at B. And I have y equals the absolute value of x minus 3. So Again, if we want to test this, the test for the x-axis is to change the sign of the y variable. So we would see, if I change that sign, will these be equivalent? And again, everything on the right side matches the original equation, but on the left side, the sign of the y has changed. These two cannot be the same thing. I cannot have what's on the right equal to both a positive and a negative of the same value. So it does not have symmetry with respect to the x-axis. Now if I check for the y-axis, that's when I need to change the sign of the x. So I will make that a negative x inside the absolute value. And just as we saw a moment ago, the absolute value of a positive number will be the same as the absolute value of the negative of that same number. This is equivalent. Therefore, I have symmetry with respect to the y-axis on this one. And it's time to look at the next slide. Two more equations at the top. 
the notice equation C. It's linear. I know that because I have uh, the x and the y variables that have no exponents on them except for one. I do not have any variables in the denominator of a fraction, and I do not see any special symbols. Uh, no absolute value signs, no square roots, or any other radicals on my variables. Now, in terms of testing for symmetry, I still have to use the test we just saw. If I want to test for symmetry with respect to the x-axis, I have to change the sign of the y. Now, when I put that in and I get ready to clean up, hopefully you recognize that 2x minus negative y becomes 2x plus y. Now, is 2x plus y equals 6 equivalent to 2x minus y equals 6? No, it's not. So let's test and see if there might be symmetry with respect to the y-axis. To do that, I'm going to change the sign of the x. So where there was an x, I'll put in negative x. And when I clean this up, 2 times negative x gives me negative 2x. Negative 2x minus y equals 6. Well, again, if I compare a positive 2x minus y cannot be the same thing as a negative 2x minus y. They are not equivalent. Only one of the signs change. They don't match. So I have no symmetry. So it's possible to have no symmetry to any axis, as we just saw. Now when you look at D, what you have is a graph where both the x and the y values are squared. If you don't recognize it, I will tell you this would uh, be the graph of a circle, but it doesn't matter whether we know what the figure would look like or not in order to test for symmetry. I just run my test, so if I want to see if it's symmetric to the x-axis, I have to change the sign of the y and then clean up the equation. Well, when I square a negative y, a negative times a negative turns into a positive. And when I clean that up, that is identical to what I started with. So I know I have symmetry with respect to the x-axis. When I run the test for symmetry to the y-axis, this time I change the sign of the x. And when I clean up, again, a negative times a negative gives me a positive. I get an equivalent equation back. It looks just like the original. So this is symmetric to both the x-axis and the y. So it's possible you can have symmetry to both axes. So here's your test to see if you have symmetry with respect to either axis. There's one more type of symmetry, and it is symmetry with respect to the origin. Now, if we have symmetry with respect to the origin, that means when we replace x with negative x and y with negative y at the same time, we would end up with an equation that would be equivalent. An example of that, if you go back and you look at d that we just saw a moment ago, if I replace both x and y with negative x and negative y, it will still result in an equation that is equivalent, which means not only was it symmetric to the x-axis and to the y-axis, it's also symmetric to the origin. And if you will scroll down for just a moment, you will see in this chart that your examples of symmetry uh, are located here at the bottom. And I want to explain what symmetry to the origin looks like. Obviously, and we'll go ahead and fill in this chart now, if I can replace y with negative y, that tells me I have symmetry with respect to the x-axis. And if you look at this example graph, we have an elliptical shape, it's an ellipse, that has a line of symmetry through the x-axis. If I were to fold on the x-axis, the two halves of this would match up. So that's why I have symmetry to the x-axis. When I'm looking for symmetry with respect to the y-axis, it means that the x is replaced with negative x, and I get something that's equivalent. And again, if you see in your graph, you could fold on the y-axis, the halves match up, as it does with this parabola. You have symmetry with respect to the y-axis. But the origin, we said, is when the x is replaced with a negative x and the y is replaced with a negative y.
And if you look at this graph, here's what that means visually if you have symmetry with respect to the origin. If you were to place, say, a pin right at the origin, right here, and you were to spin this 180 degrees, and if you do that and it looks identical to what you started with, that's how you know you have symmetry with respect to the origin. So notice this is the graph, uh, the parent graph for a cubic function, y equals x cubed. And if I replace both x and y with negative x and negative y, I will get something that's equivalent. It's just been spun 180 degrees and that's what makes it look the same. So let's run back up to our example we were going to look at, and let's run this test to see if we might have symmetry with respect to the origin. So if y equals negative 2x cubed, to test this out, remember we replace the y with negative y and the x with negative x, and then we clean this up. Well, negative y is just negative y, but on the other side, if I cube the negative x using my order of operations, a negative times a negative times a negative remains negative, but then it has to be multiplied by the negative 2. That turns it into a positive 2x cubed. Now, if I look at this compared to the original, they don't look the same currently. But remember, we have rules in algebra that allow us to manipulate one of the things that we can do is to multiply or divide each side by the same number. So if I were to divide each side by a negative 1, and the reason I want to do that is because I'm trying to see what happens if the left side is just a positive y equals, and now it will be, notice what you get on the right side. If I have a positive in the numerator divided by negative 1, it turns it into a negative, and I get negative 2x cubed, which is what I started with on the right side. That means this graph is symmetric to the origin, because when I plug it in, it will be equivalent to what I started with when I put in negative x and negative y. Now, on b, I'm going to point something out here. Look at this exponent. It's even. It's an x squared. That means when I graph it, it's going to look like this parabola right here, although it will be reflected over the x-axis because I see the negative sign. But regardless, there is no way that I can have a parabola that would be symmetric to the origin. There's no position I can put that parabola in that when I spin it 180 degrees, it would look the same. If I actually ran the test, what you will see is when I put in negative y for y and negative x for x, when I square a negative, it becomes a positive, and a positive times the negative 2 gives me negative 2x squared, and at this point, there's no way I can get this equation to match the original because if I divide each side by a negative 1, I can get the sign of the y value to turn back into a positive y, but notice on the right side, it's also going to turn into a positive. It'll be a positive 2x squared. That doesn't match. There is no symmetry with respect to the origin for this particular equation. On to the next page. Let's talk just a moment about functions that are even versus functions that are odd. And what that simply means is this. If I were to replace the original x values with negative x, and I clean it up, and it is equal to the original function. So in other words, when I change the sign of the x, then it's equivalent to the original. That means I have symmetry with respect to which axis? It would be the y-axis. And when I have symmetry with respect to the y-axis, then I have an even function. Another way you could think about it is that no signs 
change from the original. If I replace x with negative x, and it's equivalent to what I started with, I've got symmetry to the y-axis, which means I have an even function. Now, you might be tempted to get ahead of yourself here. An odd function is going to be when we replace the x with negative x, but it means that the sign of the y will also change. So in other words, we have changed the sign of the x and we have changed the sign of the y. Which symmetry test did that? That is symmetry with respect to the origin. So if, the, if I change the sign of the x and it makes all the signs change, from the original function. In other words, it changed all the signs of the y values. Then we have symmetry with respect to the origin. So if you're at, and it is possible that neither one of those happen. It might be some signs change, but not all of them. So if we're running the test to decide if our function would be even, odd, or neither, look at the first one. We have three terms, so we want to test and see what happens when we change the sign of the x. So I'm going to have a negative x in parentheses to the fifth plus 2 times negative x in parentheses cubed minus 3 times negative x. Now, if I clean this up, when I raise negative x to the fifth power, that's 5 negatives being multiplied together. That's going to be a negative x to the fifth. If I cube negative x, that's going to stay negative. So I'll have a minus 2x to the third. And then if I multiply negative 3 times negative x, that turns into a plus 3x. Now, when I compare this to the original, what I'm looking to see is if no signs change, if everything looks identical, I know that it's an even function. If all of the signs have changed, it's going to be an odd function. If some changed and some didn't, then it's neither. And when I compare these, the positive x to the fifth became negative, the positive 2x to the third became negative, and the negative 3x became positive. That means this has to be an odd function because all signs changed. Now if I look at b and I run my test with what happens if I replace x with a negative x, well, if I clean up on the right, when I square negative x, that turns it into a positive x squared. Multiply that times 2, and I have 2x squared minus 3. When I compare that to the original, no signs changed. It looks identical. That means this must be an even function. One last example. Change the sign of the x everywhere in this function. And what's going to happen is when we clean up and we squared negative x, it turns into a positive x squared. Positive 6 times negative x is minus 6x, and then we have a plus 9 at the end. Well, what I see is the first and the last terms kept the same sign, but the one in the middle changed. When some change and some don't, that tells me this is neither even or odd. All right, one more type of transformation we want to talk about is translations. That's when we move something, either right, left, up, or down. And when we have a vertical translation, it shows up at the very end of the function. So if I see plus a number or minus a number at the end of my function, that tells me whether it's moving up or down. And it is exactly as it appears. If I see plus 2, that tells me that I have a vertical shift up 2. If it's a positive 2, it's going to go up. If I had had a function and it had, say, a minus 5 at the end, if it was the x cubed and it has minus 5 at the end, that would tell me that it is a vertical shift down 5 units. So a plus sign at the end tells me I'm moving up. A minus sign at the end tells me I'm moving down. Next slide. So if we sum this up at the end of our function, if something is added there, we're going to pay attention to um, the sign. 
as long as this value is positive, then we will translate up C units when it's positive, but if C was negative, we're going to translate C units down. And that would mean we are looking at a vertical translation of the original graph. Don't worry about filling in the blanks on the top part of this box. All right. Um, if we were to look at example seven, what we have is a translation that is horizontal in nature. And notice where our plus four is showing up. It's not at the very end of the function. It's happening to the x. When anything happens to the x, okay, and I'm going to make a little note out here at the side. Anything that happens to x, and in fact, let's put that happens only to the x. It's not happening to the entire function. It will either be the x in parentheses, and then in this case, the whole thing is squared, or the x plus something inside an absolute value sign. If it's happening to the x before whatever else is supposed to happen in the function, then it is a horizontal translation. And that means we're going to be moving either to the right or to the left. And if we have a horizontal transformation it will be the opposite of how it appears in the equation. So in other words, where our vertical was very logical, and if we saw plus 2 at the end, we knew that meant that the graph moved up 2, or the minus 5 meant the graph moved down 5. When you look at this and you see x plus 4 in the parentheses, it doesn't mean you're going to move 4 to the right. It means that you're going to shift 4 to the left. It's the opposite of what you would expect. You could think of it this way. If I were to set x plus 4 equal to 0, I would discover x is actually negative 4. That's why I'm going to be moving 4 units to the left. Um, if I had given you a function like this, f of x equals the absolute value of x minus 2, that minus 2 at the end tells me that it moves 2 units which way? 2 units to the right. That's because it's happening to the x before you take the absolute value. Now, if it had been f of x equals the absolute value of x and a minus 2 at the end, that would tell me I would move 2 units which way? Down, because that would be vertical. So you have to be able to pay attention between what is a vertical translation and what is a horizontal translation. Let's move on to the next page of notes because the box at the bottom, I, I don't really like the way that it's written, and uh, we will pick up on the next. So, quick summary, if I see I have something added at the very end of the function, I'm going to be moving C units up, but if something is subtracted at the very end, I'm moving C units down. Now, if my addition of C is happening only to the X, that tells me that I'm going to move C units to the left, but if it's subtracting C, from the x value, not the entire function, just the x, then that means I'm going to move c units to the right. And what we can have is a combination of all of these translations rolled into our equation. So as we look at these examples, we're just, instead of graphing them, we're simply going to write out what kind of moves we recognize are happening in these equations. Now, if you look at this first one, the first thing I encounter is a negative sign in front of the entire function. Do you remember what that means? That tells me that this reflects over which axis? The x-axis. Remember, if it's a negative in front of the entire function, 
that's reflecting over the x-axis. Another way you could say it is it opens down because I know this would be the graph of a parabola because I see the square. Now, if I look at the minus 1 in the parentheses with the x, you have to ask yourself, what kind of, of move is that? Well, it's happening just to the x. That makes it horizontal. Anything that's happening just to the x, I think opposite. So that's going to shift 1 which way? To the right. And the plus 4 at the end tells me that it will shift up 4. So instead of graphing it, I just want you to recognize what those movements would be. If you look at b, g of x equals negative 2 times the absolute value of x plus 3. Now be careful, there's actually two pieces of information that we have in front of the absolute value part of the function. The negative sign tells me that this graph does what? It would reflect over the x-axis, or you might say it opens down. I recognize the absolute value is a v-shape, so instead of a v that opens up, it would be a v that opens down. Now the 2 that's in front means that I have, you remember what those values were? If it's greater than 1, that tells me this is a vertical stretch. A vertical stretch of 2. You have to look at both parts, the negative and the coefficient. And then the plus 3 that's inside the absolute value with the x tells me that it shifts 3 units. Which way? Shifts 3 to the left because it will be the opposite of how it appears. Now, one more transformation here to examine. This one is that square root function. I know that's half of a sideways parabola. That's one way to think about it. And what I see is I have one half in front of the square root function. So the coefficient a is actually a fraction between 0 and 1. If you remember, that tells me this is a vertical shrink of 1 half. So it will be pressed down or made wider. Now the plus 2 that is under the radical with the x, the plus 2 is happening only to the x. So that tells me it's a horizontal move and it will shift 2 to the left. And the minus 3 that's at the very end tells me that's a vertical move and that means that it will shift 3 down. Remember, vertical is exactly as it appears. Horizontal will be the opposite of what you expect. Um, let's go to the next page. We're actually not going to do the graphing on this. We're going to skip through these notes. But I want to point out that if you know the movement that should occur to your function, you could actually draw the correct function simply by plotting points. Move on to slide 9. We're going to wrap this. And this would be our summary page of all the transformations we should recognize. So if I have a plus k at the end of my function, that tells me that I have translated k units up. But if it's a minus k at the end, then I have translated, translated k units down. If I see something added only to the x, in this case it says x plus h, that means I'm going to move h units to the left. But if I see x minus h, that tells me I'm moving h units to the right because that was happening just to the x, not to the entire function. Now, when I have a value that is in front of the function, in this case the a is the coefficient, then that tells me as long as the a is greater than 1, it's a vertical stretch. But if the a value is between 0 and 1, that makes it a vertical shrink. Number 6, we're going to skip because that was the horizontal stretch or shrink, and I told you you weren't responsible for that. But we have two more. If the sign of the entire function changes, then that means that we have a reflection across the x-axis. But if the only change in sign occurs just to the x, not to the entire function, that would mean that the reflection occurs across the 
y-axis.